Let's take this time to acknowledge the positive outcomes of the last 10 years. I made it the entire 10 years, and knowing what I know now, I would do it all over again. Esta soy yo hace 10 años, y aunque ahora con más arrugas y más canas, lo que he aprendido y he logrado ha dejado una huella que jamás se borrará. I started volunteering in the initiative in 2010 as a pre-med graduate student looking for community experience and involvement. Tengo esta piedrita, que fue la que nos dieron en ese taller. Esta piedrita, cada que la miro me hace recordar que tengo que conservar mi mente y mi alma y mi cuerpo sanos para poder seguir ayudando a mi comunidad. When I first got here, there was hardly anything here. So if you couldn't help lower income residents, people coming home from prison and stuff, they had no chance. I've seen the program grow so much. I've seen so many young people get better. Grades go up, health care goes up. Our city benefits from that. These 10 years have been so exciting. Working with East Oakland Building Healthy Community has just tied a bow around all of that advocacy and all of that activism. And it's just wonderful having had that experience. Pues yo sigo aquí más que nada apoyando a las organizaciones porque son organizaciones que siempre están con nosotros. I've been so fortunate to be in proximity to the power of Boyle Heights. I'm very grateful for all of the mentors and friends I've made along the way. I have had the privilege of getting to know amazing folks, the privilege of making lifelong friends, and the honor of becoming a godfather to a wonderful Santana youth. It's been an honor and a privilege to do this work and to work alongside some of the most loving, caring, committed, and courageous individuals. It's been a great journey, one that I am grateful to have been a part of. Ten years of building youth and family power. We are more than our zip codes, and we're just getting started. The work is not over. We must continue to achieve a transformation that is not going back to normal, nor to a place where we just survive, but a place where we thrive. The California Endowment acknowledges that their work and presence is within the traditional and ancestral homelands to over 75 non-federally recognized and 109 federally recognized Native nations. From the Talawa Deni of the farthest north all the way to the Kumeyaay of the farthest south of California, the California Endowment honors the ancestors of the past as well as their relatives who we live amongst today. Today, California Native nations share their home with relatives from many other nations from around the states and the world. Many different nations of the indigenous, black, Asian, Latinx, and European communities played a role in the history and state as we know it today. It is our responsibility as guests on this land to not just acknowledge the land, but affirm and support its original peoples by creating genuine and reciprocal relationships and tangible supports to help these communities thrive in ways that center their ancestral knowledge. As we find a home in this state, may we always walk gently upon the land with love and respect for the plants, water, animals, insects, and people. Thanks to our California Native nations, we now too take on the responsibility of being good relatives and stewards to the land. Hello and good evening. Wow, what a great way to start our program tonight. My name is Kim Williams and I am the hub manager for the Sacramento Building Healthy Communities. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 10 year celebration of building power and with Building Healthy Communities. I'm so excited to be here tonight with all of you to celebrate this momentous occasion and take a look back at our accomplishments and successes that have happened across all 14 sites over the last year, over the last summary, 10 years throughout the state of California. So tonight we're gonna have a good time. Of course, we're gonna celebrate a little bit. We're gonna laugh a lot. You might see yourself or someone you know on a video. You might even shed a tear or two, but before we get started, there's something we need from all of you to participate with us. We want to know how are you feeling? So in a few seconds, a poll is going to pop up on your screen. 
And in that text box, I want you to type in a word that tells us how you're feeling tonight. We want to know if you're excited. We want to know if you're hopeful, you're energized, you're curious. Whatever that feeling is, drop it in that text box. And so at the end, we're going to pull up a big word cloud that's going to show everybody who's watching tonight how they're feeling. And you'll get the chance to see who you're feeling the same way with. So we're going to come back to that in a minute. So while you're pulling that up, I just want to take a few minutes to give a few shout outs. Um, I know my fellow hub managers are on tonight. And I just want to say whoop whoop to you and um, and big thanks and uh, for all the amazing work, the amazing work that you all have done throughout your communities over the past 10 years. You're awesome. I love you. Um, also want to shout out to all of our program managers from the endowment. You've been there with us every step of the way. We couldn't do it without you. Um, but I also want to do a huge shout out and big thank you and welcome to the residents and our community partners that are here with us tonight. The work would not be possible if it wasn't for you, your boots on the ground, getting out there in your communities and pushing to make this happen. So we're just excited that all of you are with us tonight. Okay, so I hope while I've talked a little bit, y'all drop those words in those text boxes. So I know there's hundreds of you with us tonight. So I'm expecting to see hundreds of words as this word cloud is about to pop up in a few minutes, you'll get a chance to see what comes up and let us know. Uh, so you all get to know and see what's happening right now. So as that word cloud is popping up. All right, so we see folks are feeling really good. We see that folks are excited. I love it that that's the first, the biggest word is excited. And that's what we wanna know, that folks are feeling excited. Uh, grateful, that's another, a lot of you are feeling grateful. So the bigger the word, the more folks that are, are feeling it. Um, happy, I love it, people are feeling happy. Curious, I know I'm curious too. We got a lot of that going on. Some folks are feeling nostalgic. That's, yep, we got that energized, appreciative, proud. I'm, I'm extremely proud, I'm proud of all of you and proud of all the work that we've been able to do. So as you all can see, there's a lot of positive feelings in, in the virtual room with us tonight and we're feeling real good about that. Um, so we just want you to sit back, relax, grab your snacks, something to drink, and enjoy the celebration that you're gonna watch with us for the next few hours. And now it is my honor and it is my privilege to introduce to you all the president and the CEO of the California Endowment, the man with the plan, the head visionary himself, Dr. Bob Ross. Well, so I want everybody to clap out there in virtual land. I want everybody clapping. So we're welcoming into the space. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much for the last 10 years and what you've done in allowing us to be a part of such wonderful transformation change. And we look forward to continuing to build California to a better state. Oh, it's on you. Thank, you. thank you so much, Kim. And, and thank you for bringing the kind of energy and passion this evening that you demonstrated the entire year, 10 years of BHC. You were with us from the very beginning, Kim. <laughs> right? When we came out of eight, stumbling and, and bumpy a little bit, you, you, hung, you hung in there with us. And just, uh, I, I also want to add my appreciation, not only to you, Kim Williams, and the Sacramento BHC uh, site, but also all of, all of the hub managers and all of the hub staff uh, we could not have done this uh, without you. It was an amazing 10-year um, run. And, of course, all the community residents, the young people who just, you know, came up with, with those ideas of health happens here, of VOTA, of schools, uh, not prisons. I still have my, my prisons um, hat, uh, of, of health for all. Uh, this was what you leaders and building healthy communities did you brought a new narrative of health and well-being and a new vision of health and well-being to the state of california and i would say to the nation based on all of the independent evaluations um, that we've done and so thank you for being patient with us uh, thank you for being um, energized thank you for believing and applying hope uh, when folks thought that things might be hopeless uh, you energized us, you taught us, you taught me, uh, me and the entire family at, at the California Endowment, the program staff, uh, the administration, uh, the board of directors. You're going to meet some of our board leadership in, in a little bit, uh, but we just could not possibly have done any of this uh, without you. We supported you 
you led the way and you did an amazing job of helping to make California a healthier place and setting the tone for our next 10 years of work in California. We are not running away from building healthy communities. Our work is going to continue to be about agency and voice and belonging and inclusion and racial equity and health justice and participation and young people. Those are going to be the fundamental pillars of the work that we're going to be continuing to do in the next 10 years. Uh, what a great way to celebrate our 10 year anniversary, our 10 year BHC anniversary, but also our 25th anniversary as a California endowment. Love to see the word cloud. Uh, I'm feeling all of those words as well. I'm excited, passionate, hopeful, um, energized. And now, now that we know how you're feeling, we want to know where you're from. Uh, California uh, is, is a big state. Building healthy communities uh, had participation from across the entire state, but we want to know where you're from right now. Uh, as we turn to that, I'm gonna, I just want to thank also Sarah Reyes in particular, our communications manager, uh, who's just done a phenomenal job of, of pulling all of this together. And uh, those of you in the Central Valley, I noticed some folks in the Central Valley and from Fresno, you know, you're, you've, got a, you've got a partner in crime inside the California Endowment in Sarah Reyes. We can't get through a meeting. Uh, Tony Eiton and Sandra Witt, they know this. We can't get through a meeting without uh, Sarah reminding us about, don't forget about the Central Valley. Don't forget about Fresno. So you've got a big champion uh, from the Central Valley in Sarah Reyes. And thank you, Sarah, for all of your leadership in helping to put this together. So I hope that map is up, the heat map. You just click on to the part of California uh, that you are uh, joining us tonight from. Uh, so if you're in LA, just click that area. If you're from Stockton, click that area or the Bay Area or perhaps uh, uh, Del Norte, uh, please uh, go in and click and we'll give you a minute to do that. Um, let me just uh, say uh, another word about where we are and how proud we are of the work that's happened. The California Endowment's Building Healthy Communities campaign is the single largest, longest running investment to address the social determinants of health that, of health that the nation has seen. Uh, no private sector investment uh, has invested as much resources uh, and time as we have in being patient for those investments to give us a return on those investments. And we have been thrilled uh, with the results more than 1,500 what we call wins, policy wins, practice wins, systems change wins, uh, coming mostly from those 14 BHC sites, but also statewide wins as, as well, such as schools, not prisons, um, and health for all, uh, and other work. So you have led the way with showing what um, the social determinants of health and attack, a frontal assault on the social determinants of health needs to be, uh, what, what needs to be successful. You taught us about race and racial equity and racial justice before COVID, before George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Uh, you were telling us about the importance of centering racial equity in our work. You were telling us about the importance of, of centering voice and activism and organizing and base building um, and coalition building and alliance building. We learned all of that from you and your successes. Uh, so we could not be more pleased and more proud with what we've learned and how we're applying that to the next billion dollars we're going to spend over the next 10 years uh, to improve the health of the state of California, health for all, um, equity for all, racial justice and health justice for all. So with that, let's see, is the map, uh, the heat map ready yet? Okay, there it is. Uh, and so you, you see where, where, uh, where, where the, the, the BHC family, the Building Healthy Communities family is joining us from the entire state, virtually the entire state uh, represented uh, from the far north uh, through the Bay Area into uh, the, the, the Central Valley, uh, Stockton and Fresno, um, down into Bakersfield, and then, of course, into Southern California, hooking into um, Orange County, uh, San Diego, City Heights, I'm sure is in there. Shout out to City Heights. And then going east uh, towards uh, the Inland Empire, San Bernardino, uh, Riverside, uh, folks joining us from across the entire state of California, showing not just what building healthy communities can look like for our state, but showing what building healthy communities can look like um, for the nation. So thank you for uh, for joining us this evening and taking the time to do that. Um, you got a gift box in the mail. Hopefully most of you did. If you signed up early enough, uh, Sarah sent you a, a gift box and it's got all kinds of stuff in it. It's got some healthy snacks 
in there, which I've got right here at my side, uh, a really, really colorful uh, water bottle. Uh, Health happens here, water bottle, that famous uh, uh, phrase that you all coined. Uh, I've got my uh, little bucket of apple cider on, on a makeshift uh, bucket here on ice. We're going to toast in just a second. And I've got a champagne flute, uh, or, or I guess an apple cider flute as well. Uh, make sure you reach in and get that. Um, and then I've got even, we even got pom-poms. So I'm not going to dance, but I am going to shake my pom-pom, again, celebrating the great success, of uh, the marvelous success of building healthy communities. So why don't you all take a minute right now, try and find that uh, that sparkling cider. Find your flute. It says health happens here, 10 years of building power through building healthy communities. And I'm going to pour into my glass this libation. And I just wanna to say to each and every one of you on behalf of our board, on behalf of our staff, on behalf of our entire Building Healthy Communities family, uh, peace, blessings, appreciation, love, energy. Thank you so much for your leadership in Building Healthy Communities, showing the state of California and the nation that folks that are most impacted by the issues, the folks who've been marginalized, who have been oppressed, who've been ignored, communities that have been ignored year after year after year, had the ability and capacity to be architects for a healthier nation and a healthier California. You're the experts. We thank you and appreciate your energy, your wisdom, and what you brought to the table. Salud, building healthy communities. And with that, um, we have a special guest message uh, on video. Uh, an important person who you all will recognize, but I guess I'll, I'll break the drama it's from uh, our own governor, Governor Gavin Newsom, who, uh, when he got inaugurated, I went to his inauguration, much of the language and phraseology that the governor used, the equity for all, the for all language, the inclusion language, the language of belonging um, as a state of California, much of that was the narrative of building healthy communities. So with that, uh, can we queue up the message from the governor? Hey everybody, it's Governor Gavin Newsom here and let me just express my deep appreciation and congratulations to each and every one of you, my friends over at the California Endowment on your 25th anniversary and on the last 10 years of building healthy communities all across our state. I also wanna thank you, each and every one of the residents and the organizers and advocates as well as young people joining us tonight that have been part of this journey as well. Your legacy is not only in felt in the makeup of our administration, but you also have influenced the trajectory of our state. I'm proud to say that with our California Comeback Plan, we're gonna get a step closer to health for all. You know, we're proposing as one proof point of that, Medi-Cal, for all Californians, regardless of pre-existing conditions, ability to pay, regardless of their immigration status, 60 and older, we're proud of that, building on the work we've done over the last number of years. Look, the goal of advancing health and justice for all Californians, it will continue for the next 25 years and, of course, well beyond that. But let's take a moment, take a moment to, to celebrate the collective victories and all the extraordinary work each and every one of you have done. Best wishes uh, on all of these efforts, and thank you, each and every one of you, for the privilege of joining you, at least virtually, for this event. I think the TCE and BHC approach was revolutionary in terms of the engagement process. Everywhere from high school, middle school kids trying to make a difference in their school towards community benefiting organizations and these large nonprofits. You start feeling this immense feeling of, I can really do this, I can really make a difference. And you're not doing it alone. You're doing it with your entire community.
Well, hi everybody. Uh, this is Tony Eiton coming at you live from Oakland. Hope my Oakland peeps are in the house. Uh, I just want to add my welcome to the over a thousand people out there um, who are here to celebrate both our 25th anniversary and just a 10 year run of building healthy communities. I wanted to say that uh, the 10 years of building healthy communities have been the pinnacle of my career. And I have each and every one of you to thank for that. Um, I feel like we have grown an enormous family across California with an eye on equity that will never, ever, ever burn out. So uh, like uh, my colleagues before me, we also have a poll. Um, we want to know one word, one word about what BHC means to you. When you think BHC, what is that one word? So if you can um, put that word in into the chat and we will um, put that word cloud together. Um, in the meantime, I wanna tell you just one fond memory of building healthy communities. And this was really hard. And it was hard to figure out of the hundreds of just incredible memories uh, in building healthy communities, which one would I pull out of that huge bin and, and recount to you all. And I, I decided that the one that stands out the most for me happened in Fresno. Um, when we uh, worked together with uh, just an incredible group of young people who decided that they um, needed to build a skate park in Fresno. And as many of you know, Parks for All campaign in Fresno is one of the most incredibly successful campaigns uh, that we saw in building healthy communities and, and maybe have seen in California. Um, it has led to millions and millions of dollars of park investments uh, in, in the city of Fresno, particularly in the southeast part of Fresno, uh, to try to address some of the park um, injustice that's been happening in Fresno for decades. But anyhow, uh, I was invited to the opening of a skate park. Um, I've been to openings before, but never of a park. And one of the most exciting parts of it was, was this. Uh, we got to cut a ribbon with these incredibly big scissors. And these are real scissors. They actually operate. And so as I stood there with a group of other people, hands on the scissors with legislators and, and city council people, and community leaders and young people and architects that had designed the park, including young people. Um, I had this feeling, just this feeling of, of thrill as I looked around and saw thousands of young people in helmets with their skateboards and their trick bikes, just ready to get onto that skate park. And so we took out the big scissors and we cut the ribbon and onto the skate park flood this just this wave of young people and they are active doing flips and jumps and just grins from ear to ear and i don't think i've ever felt better doing anything uh you know related to work in my life of course now i have a big dilemma i have a big pair of scissors and i don't know what to do with them so if anybody has any ideas i, I don't know maybe there's a gardener who needs them i'm not quite sure but uh, they are real scissors. The other thing that I have, I was gifted and I'm very proud of, is a BMOC skateboard. And now one of these days, I'm going to put some wheels on it and actually try to skateboard, but today is not that day. All right. So the next thing I want to do is I want to show you just a couple slides. I mean, I'm known around here as a little bit of the nerd, the data nerd of, of TCE. And it's really important for me uh, to be able to describe to you um, why this work was so important. Um, one of the things that was really critical about it is that we actually worked together with 50,000 young people, community residents, partners, co-collaborators, conspirators to build Building Healthy Communities. That's the family of BHC. Next slide. And we had incredible results. Um, I looked up the data today. When we started looking at school discipline, and I'll tell you that school discipline issue did not come from TCE, it came from you. 
I remember a meeting out in Fresno, another one in Merced, in Oakland, in Los Angeles, where young people were telling us that this was an issue for them. And we decided to pursue that issue. And at the time when we first looked at it, there were 800,000 young people being suspended and expelled in California every year. I looked at the data just this afternoon and we're down below 300,000, actually 233,000. Still not where we'd like to be, but a dramatic drop from where we started. We still see some disproportionality amongst African-Americans um, and we're continuing to work on that. Next slide. We've also seen um, positive uh, school climate initiatives, restorative justice, next slide, and um, just incredible efforts uh, across the state to make schools a springboard for opportunity for our young people. We saw 5 million people get health insurance under the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, many of them uh, in Medi-Cal. That is more than most states um, so just incredible work of building healthy communities. Next slide, please. And, and, and finally, um, over a million people are eligible to reclassify their low-level felonies as misdemeanors and no longer have to check the box on school, uh, on, on housing applications or employment uh, applications. Just, we all contributed to that. This is why we're so grateful to you. We want to celebrate tonight but also appreciate the hard work and results that we achieved when working together. Next slide, please. So we had um, 10,000 people released from incarceration under a variety of different propositions. Next slide. And um, we have our juvenile uh, justice systems, our juvenile justice system being reimagined and looking at reinvesting these resources into positive, supportive youth development. Uh, and dismantling the cages. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, a focus on rehabilitation, investing in the young people um, who have been essentially disinvested from in their communities, in their families, because of a legacy of racism and discrimination. Next slide. And next slide. Our work has made incredible impact. And not just for us, not just for now, for generations to come. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of the blood, sweat, and tears that you poured into that work. Uh, we did this together, and we're going to continue doing it together over the next decade. All right, let's see. Can we bring back the poll results? All right, so the one word that people see describing building healthy communities, God, this is going to make me cry transformative, community, power, empowerment, hope, collaboration, family, change, advocacy, inspiring. Well, I guess we all agree um, we've done something great together. All right, it's now my uh, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Randy Viegas, is the son of immigrant parents and part of a mixed status family. He joined BHC um, in South Kern. And in, in June of 2015, as a youth uh, reporter and was later hired as a reporter for the program. Uh, he has written commentaries and op-eds about immigration rights, civic engagement, and has highlighted the need for intersectionality. Thank you, Randy. His pieces have been published in the Los Angeles Times, the Bakersfield Californian, South Kern Soul, El Popular, a Spanish newspaper in, in Bakersfield. Randy has always been a fearless advocate for um, those communities that are facing injustice. As Americans, it is our duty to stand up against injustice, regardless of religion, color, gender, citizenship status, or sexual orientation. Today, we stand as one. When there is hate or intolerance in our community, we must stop it in its tracks. When there are inequalities that exist within our own institutions, we must not be afraid to speak out against them, said Randy in a speech he recited at a unity rally, rally hosted by South Kern Soul um, that uh, we all should read. Randy's been the recipient of numerous awards, including the American Political Science Association Fund for Latino Scholarship, scholarships from the Winter Guard International and the Eugene Cota Robles Foundation, our fellowship, excuse me, Randy is currently featured in the California State Capitol Museum 
uh, in their uh, Unity exhibit for his work around social justice issues in Kern County. After completing his uh, PhD, he hopes to return to the, his community in the Central Valley to inspire other young scholars and to make a meaningful difference in people's lives. Over to you, Randy. Hi, everyone. My name is Randy Villegas. I'm currently a professor of political science at College of the Sequoias and a PhD candidate at UC Santa Cruz. And now, if you would have told Randy Villegas in this photo from 10 years ago that that's where I would be today, I probably would have looked at you a little bit funny. Since then, I've learned how to tuck in my shirt and how to tie a tie. But 10 years ago is really when I started getting more involved in my community to learn about local issues and how we can change our communities for the better. And that all happened by attending a community meeting with VHC. And for me, VHC as a youth was a place where I could meet other young people and adult allies who were dedicated to improving our communities and shaping them for the better. It's also the place where I learned how to find my voice. As a youth reporter for South Grand Soul, I learned how to investigate, how to write, and how to speak out on issues that were important to my community and to me. Issues like inequality in student funding, like safe drinking water and access to safe drinking water, participatory budgeting, and community engagement. Throughout the last 10 years, I've learned how to write, how to advocate, and how to organize alongside phenomenal individuals and community-based organizations. And a lot of that is due to BHC. I've been able to take opportunities of events and uh, opportunities that I never would have had otherwise because of BHC. I remember traveling to Sacramento for the very first time at the young age, I want to say of about uh, maybe 19 or, or 20 years old. And I remember meeting so many young folks at the Capitol advocating for change in their communities. Uh, folks from Del Norte, Coachella, Long Beach, Santana, Stockton, Fresno, Merced, Boyle Heights, City Heights, Oakland, Richmond, Sacramento, and of course, Southern LA and Kern County. I later on transitioned to be a mentor at the Sons and Brothers Camp, where I not only met more inspiring youth from across the state, but also learned from our elders about how to reimagine what justice, community, and healing can look like. And that's really what BHC has been all about, challenging youth across our state to reimagine what our communities could become with the right investments and the right leadership on these issues. That we are more than our zip codes and what our determinants and these statistics are based upon that our health goes beyond the doctor's office to take into consideration the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the resources that we deserve access to as community members, including sidewalks, green spaces, and youth having a seat at every single decision-making table. In the last 10 years, I've seen youth become empowered to become these decision makers, to run for office, to become community advocates, organizers, and leaders that our communities deserve. And we're just getting started. That's why I'm so excited and hopeful to see young people on the forefront of change for years to come and this work to transform and build healthier communities. I wanna say thank you to the California Endowment, thank you to Building Healthy Communities, and thank you to all of you for being a part of these efforts to transform our communities with youth all across the state uh, in the past and for years to come. Thank you. This is my city. Student chanting Black Lives Matter because it's true. This is my California. Giving volume to the voices of trans women at the Women's March because woman means them too. This is my country. Catholic grandmother on bus defending hijab wearing girl. Immigrant learning a new language. Native remembers an old one. Rarely spoken in this world. This is who we are, resistance nonstop, black, bold, queer and unquiet, woman and wonder, white and woke, immigrant and American, rising up to the mountaintops. Those pain in the past where people lived, and it's far from pretty. But I hope intersects like the freeways of our cities to those who doubt the solidarity streaming from our throats. We say that rising tide lifts all boats. You get a wave when one person rises up like a sun, but you get a movement when the brave rise up as one.
Hi, I'm Assemblymember Anthony Rendon, and I want to congratulate the California Endowment on their 25th anniversary. Also, 10 years on building healthy communities. California Endowment does amazing work, particularly in my district, on keeping the streets safe. A couple of years ago, we did some amazing work uh, in order to make sure that uh, immigrant communities had access to Medi-Cal. Again, fantastic work. Congratulations. Happy birthday, California Endowment. May you have many, many more. Good evening. I am Senate President Pro Tempore Tony Atkins. It is my pleasure to congratulate you on your 25th anniversary. The work the California Endowment's organizers, advocates, and young people do to promote wellness, especially amongst those often overlooked, has made our state a healthier place for everyone. By putting social justice and equity at the forefront, you've led by example and demonstrated that healthy living starts in our homes, in our schools, and in our communities. Thank you. In particular, Dr. Robert Ross, whose dedication to health care for all is a North Star for the great work you do. California is fortunate to have the endowment in our corner. Happy anniversary. Hi, I'm Senator Alex Badia, and I want to congratulate the California Endowment on your 25th anniversary. 25 years of not just advocacy, but true leadership, both on health care and on equity. Equity and quality health care uh, doesn't come easy, and you've been at the forefront of that fight. And thank you as you have fought that fight for empowering young leaders who will carry on the fight for years to come. It is impossible to congratulate Dr. Ross in 30 seconds. All that he has meant to the state of California, to our country, to me personally, as a friend, as a mentor, as somebody who has taken philanthropy to an entirely different level, who has helped bring about change on every level of government and in so many communities across the state. Across the state. Congratulations, Dr. Ross. I wish you many more years. The endowment has made such a huge difference and you as the leader of the endowment has absolutely helped to change the state of California. Hello everyone, my name is Sandra Witt. I'm a program director at the California Endowment and it is wonderful to be here with you all today celebrating BHC and each and every one of you who has made BHC what it is today. The power of BHC helped us all to reimagine what California can be. Your work did that. And we'd like to take a poll and have you think about one word that you would use to describe the future of California and type it in the box. So just one word to describe the California you want to see. Type it in the box and we'll come back in, in, a, in a few minutes and see what your highest hopes for our state are. I have been privileged to be part of BHC for the last 10 years. Throughout that time, you have inspired me. I have learned so much from all of you about what it means, and more importantly, what it actually takes to build the power of young people and adults to transform systems, to achieve racial and health equity so that we can have a California where everyone belongs. When I think back on BHC, there's so many special memories, so many accomplishments, but it's really the relationships, the connections, that you all built through working together, through struggling together to make a difference in our communities. That is the enduring power of BHC for me. 
One of my fondest memories where this was on full display was at the, um, the BHC convening in LA five years ago. Do you remember that? Over 800 people um, from across the state coming together to share, learn, network, organize together, build solidarity together, and learn from each other about the deep transformational work that was happening in our 14 BHC sites and across the state. I remember the excitement, the energy, the deep human connection, the relationships that only have gotten stronger since then. And I'll never forget the anything is possible, the si se puede spirit that fill the space, the sense of community, the sense of a BHC family, and the love that filled our hearts that I continue to draw upon when times get tough. So thank you. Okay, let's get back to the poll and see what words you use to describe the California you want to see in the future. So the words that really pop up, equity, equality, justice, liberation, health equality, equitable. That, that is our vision, right? Like this is our vision for the California that we wanna see in the future. The, these are our North Stars as we continue to work together over the next 10 years. So thank you for, for doing that and inspiring us all. Now it's my honor to introduce you to two amazing resident leaders who have been involved in BHC for the last 10 years. Amber Jensaw from our northernmost BHC site in the Del Norte and adjacent tribal land, a young Yurok woman who started as a youth leader and is now a board member with True North Organizing, a Head Start teacher and a new mom. And from our most Southern BHC site, City Heights, Ramla Saeed, a young Somali woman who began her BHC journey as a resident and is now the executive director of her own nonprofit and a new mom. They will speak on behalf of the hundreds of residents who participated and built power and voice over the past 10 years of BHC. I agree, Nick now Amber. I'm thankful to be a part of BHC, but to have BHC be a part of my community. BHC has helped keep my passion strong for lending a helping hand. BHC has helped our community strengthen our voices and has given us the tools to create positive change. Having a healthy community is important, but having a healthy community also means having a healthy environment. The water and the land are very important to us, even more so in our rural areas. In the past 10 years, Building Healthy Communities has helped to improve our schools by helping us get the data we need to compete statewide and nationally for funding that can expand our work and our, strengthen our communities, tribes, and our villages. BHC has helped prepare our region to pursue a major grant application for the U.S. Department of Education's Promised Neighborhoods Program. It's not only built on the BHC's previous relationships with over 15 community anchor partners, such as the school districts and county governments, but it's allowed a tribe, the Yurok tribe, to lead this collaborative process for all of these community partners. This was basically revolutionary and was made possible due to the help of BHC's previous decade of work in our region. The Building Healthy Communities Initiative was launched. It brought with it a new energy, excitement, and hope that rippled across the community, bringing together neighbors who invested their time and talent to build power. City Heights residents saw that when we come together, we win, resulting in changes in policy, new investments in our children, and a seat at the table. But we also learned a lot. We learned that access doesn't equal power and that we must stand firm in our demands and in our values because our winds are vulnerable and need to be protected. So, the fight continues. Hi. We're making history. We're setting up the stage for everyone else. I saw other indigenous communities struggling with medical issues in the same way as my mom was, and so that's why I decided to get a lot more involved. I think for our communities, it's really easy to build people power because that's already rooted in us. 
to have each other's backs and to have support for each other. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see all of you out there. I want to thank you all for coming to celebrate our collective work. I'm Ray Colmenar, and I'm one of the managing directors at the California Endowment. I want to express my deep appreciation for all of you, our partners and grantees, for your leadership and partnership in making California a healthier and more just state. During the past 10 years, we saw your power and your voice focusing the public attention and policymakers on the critical issues like the lack of access to health care, high incarceration rates, disproportionate school suspensions, and the list goes on and on. I'm sure you have plenty of vivid memories from these fights for health and justice. So let's, let's reflect on some of these campaigns and, and complete our next poll and this poll, as it comes up, uh, will ask you your favorite campaign during the BHC over the past 10 years. Make sure you vote only once and you have one choice. And the selections are schools, not prisons, health for all, rise up as one, and or a local campaign. Select your favorite campaign. Remember, just one and we'll give you a minute to answer the poll question. Meanwhile, I'd like to share, while you're filling that out, I'd like to share one of my special memories of building healthy communities. Um, my favorite memory is really more than just one memory. It's really the annual youth advocacy days that happens at the Capitol. Um, some of the images that you'll see are images of young people and their allies are just a sample of what has transpired at BHC over the past 10 years. Thousands of you, literally thousands of you from all around California traveled to Sacramento to tell your stories to our policymakers. From San Diego to Coachella Valley to Oakland to Del Norte, thousands of young people with their adult allies advocated for policies that has transformed our communities improving our schools and neighborhoods and making sure that young people and their families have increased opportunities in the future. We thank you for your leadership and partnership in making California a healthier state for all. All right, let's go back to the poll results. So what's everyone's favorite campaign? All right, it looks like a tie between Health for All and Schools Not Prisons, followed closely by local site campaigns and Rise Up as One. Thank you so much for completing that poll. And uh, my, now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce two of our valued statewide partners who will you, you will hear from next. The first is Myra Alvarez, who is president of the Children's Partnership, a statewide policy and advocacy organization working to advance child health equity by ensuring all children have the resources and opportunities they need to grow up healthy and lead productive lives. The second person you will hear from this video is Mark Philpart. Mark is a managing director at PolicyLink and is the principal coordinator for the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. The Alliance for Boys and Men of Color is a network of more than 200 organizations and leaders working to advance race and gender justice by expanding access to opportunity, health and well-being, and transforming systems that are failing boys and men of color 
their families and communities. Enjoy Myra and Mark Philpart. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ray. We are honored to be here together to celebrate the California Endowment's 25 years and the culmination of 10 years of building healthy communities. The work of the endowment has helped to transform our state and national narrative for advancing health equity and racial justice. As statewide advocates, we know our collective advocacy is stronger because of the power we built together with our communities. Building healthy communities has been a game changer for California. Because of our collective work, more policymakers understand that our neighborhoods hold the keys to health, opportunity, and equity. We made it clear that there's no health equity without racial justice. And there's no doubt that through building healthy communities, we expanded our power across California. At the Capitol, youth leaders spoke their truth with courage and conviction. And over the past 10 years, youth and community leaders have shared their experiences of being pushed out of school and into probation, of the enduring pain of losing family members to police violence, and of the need for culturally rooted and community-based approaches to healing. BHC leaders brought their whole selves, their dreams and collective demands for community-led solutions that value self-determination and also affirm their humanity. Through new networks like the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, TCE grantees and partners from Del Norte to Stockton to San Diego came together to share solutions and amass wins that remove systemic barriers to opportunity and resource the possibility. The Alliance was among BHC's first steps towards centering racial equity and one of its earliest expressions of power building, all of which is now at the core of the endowment's future strategy. And in fact, this work made waves far beyond California, helping to inform and influence national priorities for boys and men of color. And making waves is what the endowment does, raising the bar and opportunities to align efforts, break down silos, and move forward a shared goal of health for all. TCE has supported through partners at the community and state level, a recognition that the fight for racial justice is intertwined with the fight for health justice. And that recognition is heard and felt throughout California and across the nation. With partners, the endowment is uplifting community voice, it's centralizing people power, and pushing back against long-standing racial inequalities, like white supremacy, anti-blackness, and structural racism. Inequalities that are seeped in our programs, our policies, and communities, and that rob our people of the opportunities, services, and supports they need to live healthy and thrive. Together, we are creating a new way forward that disrupts oppressive systems, defers to community leadership, and demands bold innovations that put the well being of our communities first. As for the future, we're ready for more more solidarity, more race and gender justice, more truth, more transformation, and more liberation. This decade of community building has taught us many lessons. One of the most important is that when we work together, we wield the power to transform our communities and the state. And nowhere is this more possible than in our state of California. As we look to the future, we know that the endowment will continue to be at the side of partners and communities in defiant resistance to the inequities that have plagued our communities for far too long. This is a moment to not go back to business as usual because going back is accepting the status quo that left far too many children, families, and communities behind. Through the valuable lessons of BHC and the incredible work of TCE, we have this moment to seize and to bring about real change. And in doing so, we pave a better way forward for our communities, our state, and our country. Thank you, TCE. The people power is what's now creating an opportunity for shifts. I think that the political landscape has shifted and I think that now system leaders, philanthropic partners, elected officials are more responsive. 
And I don't think that shift would have occurred if people weren't on the streets, people weren't demanding change and justice. Why would you not support things that heal and help our communities? Good evening, friends. What a joy to be with you. What an incredible night to celebrate 25 years of the work of the California Endowment. And there is no better way to celebrate, no more greater accomplishment than building healthy communities with all of you. I'm Bishop Minerva Carcaño. I am the president of the California Endowment Board of Directors. It is great to be with you. On behalf of the board, I want to say thank you. Thank you, mil gracias por todo lo que ustedes han hecho en estos diez años. We are so moved by your tenacity, by your perseverance, by the commitment of your hearts and your spirits to make California, every family, every child, every young person, every senior person, seasoned person, to have the opportunity to be healthy and to be well. We thank you for your work. You not only inspire us, but you inform the work of the TCE Board of Directors. We don't want to let you down. We're with you, and we hope to continue journeying with you into the next 10 years. On this evening, it's my great privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for this night, the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. He is the president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach. He is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. He is the bishop with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, a visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary and pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He's also the author of four books. I wonder where he finds the time to do all of this amazing work. But his books are critical to our thinking and our hoping and our visioning. They're books that focus on the need for a nation that has a moral heart and a commitment to new justice. He is indeed the architect of the moral movement, which began in 2013 with weekly Moral Monday protests at the North Carolina General Assembly. In 2018, Dr. Barber helped to relaunch the Poor People's Campaign. I know that you remember your history. This campaign was begun by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. It calls for a moral agenda and a moral budget to address the interlocking injustices that you and I know of systemic racism, of systemic poverty, the war on the economy, militarism, ecological devastation, and denial of health care, and the false moral narrative of Christian nationalism. Dr. Barbara has been a keynote speaker across the country and around the world. We are truly privileged to have him with us tonight. He spreads himself out in support of unions, of women's rights groups, economic policy groups. He stands with those who are advocating for the voting rights. He stands with LGBT equality and justice groups. He's there when the call is for environmental and criminal justice advocacy. He stands with domestic and fast food workers. He stands with God's people everywhere. He is also a person who has been invited to the highest places of power in this country because his voice is heard and needed there as well. In 2016, he gave the keynote address at the national and, and state uh, conferences and went on to give also the Democratic National Convention address, one of the addresses there. You may remember that recently, January 21 of this year, he delivered the homily, the sermon uh, that uh, 
biblical message at the inaugural prayer service for President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. He's also been in dialogue with the Pope, with Pope Francis, speaking at the Vatican, responding to Pope Francis' letter on the care for our common home. Dr. Barber has served as the president of the North Carolina NAACP and has been on the board of the National NAACP Board of Directors as well. His work has not gone unnoticed. He's been the recipient of the North Carolina Award, the state's highest civilian honor. He is a MacArthur Foundation genius. He's received that award, and we are grateful for that award that has enabled him to continue to do the thoughtful work that he has been about. He's also a recipient of the Franklin D. Roosevelt for Freedoms Award and the Puffin Award. He has had 10, 10 honorary degrees conferred upon him. You have probably heard him on MSNBC, on CNN, the New York Times, read his words in the New York Times and in the Washington Post and in the Nation magazine. And yet he has time for us on this night. And we are so grateful. Welcome, Dr. Barber. Thank you so much, uh, Your Grace, Bishop, for a gracious introduction that reminds me that God is more full of grace than we are of effort and ability. And I'm so thankful for that. To this great gathering, D.C., California Endowment, to Dr. Ross, your leader, and to all of you who have spent so much time doing so much good for so many people. Tonight, I, I want to celebrate your 25 years and those 10 years you mentioned, but I want to celebrate them for this reason, because that means that you have now the wisdom and the stamina for the fight that is with us in this moment. I come from a tradition that says you cannot talk about hope without going through the despair. Jurgen Moltmann said one time that faith, when it develops into hope, is not the kind of hope or faith that quiets the soul, but creates the unquieted soul that can no longer deal, stand for the despair and is willing to suffer underneath it in order to change it and transform it. And that is real hope. So tonight, I, I want this celebration, in my view, is a consecration because the work is far from over. And I want to suggest that in California and in this nation, we need a third reconstruction. And you've got to be a part of it. You've been a part of doing so much. But we need a third reconstruction fully addressing poverty and low wealth from the bottom up. You know, we've come through this pandemic and it has been devastating. More deaths than the, all of the deaths in the um, World War I, World War II, uh, Vietnam combined, combined just in this country alone. But this pandemic has also revealed uh, the connection between systemic racism and systemic poverty, the fissures that existed before the pandemic that actually made the pandemic in some ways more deadly. Most of the people that suffered in this pandemic were poor and low wealth people and those whose health insurance is still connected to their job and not to their bodies or to those that don't have health insurance and even now. We've come through a pandemic and we've not had this nation decide that everybody needs health care or living wages in the midst of a pandemic where 8 million more people fell into poverty while billionaires made $2 trillion. And so tonight, as you celebrate, I also want you to recommit because we must be clear that we had a pandemic of pre-existing conditions, a pandemic of pre-existing conditions 
before the pandemic ever hit, and they are still with us. The pandemic of greed, the pandemic of policy lies, the pandemic of moral distortion. And because of this, even before the pandemic, there were over 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. Think about that, 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. And this reality of injustice and poverty and low wealth is deeply entwined with the injustices of systemic racism, the denial of health care and ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false and distorted moral narrative of religious and Christian nationalism that seeks to blame the poor and the uninsured rather than addressing the systems that cause it. But we also know when we talk about death, because every regressive public policy has a death measurement. We know from Columbia University that even before the pandemic, 700 people died every day from poverty, poverty. 250,000 people a year were dying before poverty. That's why we cannot talk about a death measurement during the pandemic and then go back to not talking about one post the pandemic. 700 people dying a day. In this society before the pandemic, 40% of the country, 40% of the country could not fulfill their potential. 43% of this nation living in poverty and low wealth. And with 8 million more people falling into poverty during the pandemic, the numbers are getting closer to 50. And with child poverty, that is America's great moral failing that over 50% of our children live in poverty and low wealth. Now, what does this look like? 140 million people poor and low wealth are one emergency away from economic ruin. 52% of our children, 39 million children before the pandemic, 45% of women, 74 million women, 60% of black people, 24 million, 64% of Latino people, 38 million, 40% of Asian and Pacific Islanders, 8 million, 59% of native and indigenous people, 2 million, and 33% of white people, 66 million people. And it was in every region, even before the pandemic, 50 million poor and low wealth people in the South, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Missouri, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, 40 million people poor and low wealth in Appalachia. Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Maryland, Mississippi, North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. 8.6 million poor and low-wealth people in New York alone. Over 40 million poor and low-wealth people in the southwest border states, Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Texas, Utah. And 20 million in California alone. 20 million, even before the pandemic, in California alone. 20 million in the Midwest, the, the industrialized states like Ohio and Indiana and Michigan and Illinois. 11 million in the Northeast, Connecticut, Delaware, states like Maryland and Rhode Island. 7 million in the Northwest, like in Alaska, Idaho and Oregon and Wyoming, and 7 million in the Great Plains, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, 700,000 in Hawaii, 300,000 in Washington, D.C. So for, for even before the pandemic, there was the pandemic of pre-existing condition, the pandemic of poverty that targets every, every geog geographic area, every demographic, every race, every creed, every color, and it only deepened. And that this, this poverty reality deepened the inequities of health and economic security and education and housing and jobs and policing and home ownership. The fact of the matter is during COVID, the people who we call essential workers were the poorest and the low wealth people. They got had to go to work first, they got infected first, they got sick first, they went to the hospital first, and they died first. And yet the one measurement that the government hasn't been keeping up with the government has been poverty and low wealth and the impact on poor and low wealth people with COVID. 
But not only that, poverty, we have this reality of racism, systemic racism. You know, people are talking about everybody's believing the big lie, and that's why we have 300 states now that are trying to pass uh, racist voter suppression laws because 60% of all state capitals are controlled by extremists who have hijacked the Republican Party. It's not my grandfather's Republican Party or Abraham Lincoln's party. But you know, we should stop for a minute and remember that since 2010, long before Trump, long before the big lie, long before January 6th, since 2010, 25 states passed new voter restrictions. Racist gerrymandering, racist in I in North Carolina, we fought for four years against a racist voter suppression law that the courts later on said was racism with surgical precision. And that was in 2013. And when the when the when the Voting Rights Act was gutted, one of our state senators said, now that the headache has been removed, we can retrogress the law. Retrogress. We can take away from people what they have used, what we won. It took us 25 years to win same-day registration in North Carolina, and they took it away. And we see that happening today. But we would be mistaken to say this is only happening now and only happening because of the lie. What do we have, have now is it's gone nuclear. 43 states have introduced over 300 bills meant to limit access to the ballot. That's racism, but it's not just racism targeted at black people. It's targeted at black people, brown people, and native people, and it's not just racism. It's classism. It's targeted at poor people. That's why we need, I don't think we should call it Jim Crow. We should call it James Crow Esquire. And we should understand that this voter suppression is also targeted at policies. Because all of the people pushing racist, class-based, James Crow Esquire voting restrictions, those same persons are against health care and against living wages, against immigrant rights and women's rights and LGBTQ rights. We have to understand that the attack on voting rights is not just an attack against black people or the civil rights movement. It is an attack against this democracy. It is an attack from those who only believe in voting when they know who's going to vote and when certain people vote, but they do not believe in a democracy for the rest of us. And then even before the pandemic, we had 50 million people who were working for low wages, 62 million people working for less than $17 an hour, 32 million working for less than $15 an hour, 40% of the black and Latino workers in this country, 30% of white workers before, before COVID. 59% of low-wage workers were women before COVID. Six million essential workers are immigrants, including five million undocumented immigrants and native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are the highest represented subgroup among so-called essential workers. More than 25 million workers have been directly hurt by the epidemic, uh, by the economic impacts of the pandemic. And more than half of low-wage jobs that were lost have not returned, and women carry a disproportionate share of unpaid care work, which would total $1.5 trillion at the current minimum wage of $7.25. And people in the restaurant industry, waiters still only make $2.13 an hour plus tax, 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 tips. So these were pre-existing prior to the pandemic. So one of the things we celebrate about the the California endowment is you've got all these years of service and making ways out of no ways. That means you're ready. You're ready for this, this fight that we have to wage now. The Economic Policy Institute says if we don't have fundamental change and not just a policy here, a policy, it would take people 15 years to recover from this pandemic. And that is if nothing else happened over the next 15 years. We know right now that the average hourly wage a full-time worker would need to afford a modest two-bedroom apartment is $23 an hour. Even before the pandemic, 30 to 40 million people were at risk of homelessness, and 25 to 50 million people face food insecurity, including a disproportionate share of Black, Latino, American, Indian, Alaskan, Native. My, my daughter's a public health specialist, and she said, Daddy, when you ask people how they're doing health-wise, that can't just be about their physical, how's their heart doing, how's their, their, their back doing, how's their, their eye, how their eyes doing, but how is the surroundings around them? What is the, what is the environment? 
and we have a sickness in this nation that existed prior to the pandemic. We had the pandemic of poverty and systemic racism and ecological devastation and denial of health care and greed and policy lies and a war economy even before. In this country, even before the pandemic, we had 60 million adults with disabilities, 26% of them living below the poverty line, 10% are uninsured, 7 million students with disabilities. And, and if you use the official poverty measurement, it says that if you make $12,800 a year, you're not poor. And I say, in what world? What scholars tell us now is we not, must use the supplemental poverty measurement that takes into account all the modern necessities and debt burdens that, that, that are part of what it means to have a household. It says then when you look at the SPM, when you look at that, it tells us that the, that the, 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 it, the cost of living in this nation today amounts to twice what the official poverty measurement says. So we're measuring poverty wrong. It says that it's $60,000 for a family, a household of four. I saw the four. And yet, even before the pandemic, we saw attacks on social welfare and anti-poverty programs being underfunded and some unfunded in an attempt to cut SNAP and food stamps. And right now in 2017, do you know food stamps is only $1.40 per meal? And Head Start reaches only 54% of eligible three to four years old, even before the pandemic? We also know that we have an environmental challenge. The expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure led to 5,000 significant oil ruptures and pipelines and more than 2,400 uh, 2, oil spills in the United States and 1,100 coal ash ponds having leaking problems. And we know that native and indigenous reservations cover just 2% of the United States and ancestral and sacred lands are at risk of being devastated by mining and extraction and pollution. We know that tens of millions of Americans cannot afford access to clean water. 44 million people are living with water systems that violate the Safe Drinking Water Act. That's where we are. These are the, this is the pandemic that existed before the pandemic. We know that for over a half million households lack access to complete plumbing with Native American households more likely to face water access issues than any other household. And then on top of that, before the pandemic, despite all of these threats to health, 119 rural hospitals have been closed in 41 states since 2010. Since 2010. Even before we got to Trump, 87 million people are uninsured or underinsured coming into the pandemic. And the United States has the worst ranking of public health outcomes among our peer countries, including the lowest life expectancy and the highest infant and mortality rates in the world. And it doesn't have to be like this. It isn't like this in Germany and like this in Sweden. There are a lot of countries that are far less wealthier than us that are doing so much better than us. And then we know that 53 cents of every federal discretionary dollar before the pandemic went to the Pentagon, to the war economy, while we only spent 15 cents toward anti-poverty programs and infrastructure and health care. And we know that you, we could literally cut $350 billion from defense spending and we would have more money than China, North Korea, Iran, Iraq, and Russia combined, and that money could be taken, but we couldn't even get senators to cut $10 million billion and put it toward health care and education and infrastructure. 19 million veterans in the nation, 38,000 are homeless. Many, many veterans live, for, live in, in poverty. Seven to 18% of military families and veterans are on food assistance. And why is it that America is also 5% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's incarceration? And 74% of those in jail have not been convicted of any crime. 
And we've had over a thousand police killings every every year since 2013, with black, native, and indigenous people more likely to be killed by the police. And yet, 98% of police killings since 2013 have not resulted in criminal charges. And where is our strength as a nation is in our immigrants. We still have an immigration system that criminalizes immigration and migration. It prioritizes detention and deportation, even though immigrants, regardless of their status, pay more than $490 billion in taxes. And if we pull our immigrant brothers and sisters out of this economy, it would implode. And yet they pay all of these taxes, but they are virtually excluded from safety social net programs. And every year in this country, we spend a trillion dollars in endless wars and mass incarceration and policing and immigration. But the studies say that the greatest threat to America is not Russia, but white supremacy and violent hate groups and violent hate groups. And in the midst of all this, in the midst of even the pandemic, while we had more people in poverty, Billionaires added nearly $2 trillion to their wealth. Jeff Bezos, for instance, said he would give a little money to black groups because he cared about Black Lives Matter. And then two days later, he cut all of the extra pay, emergency pay, to his workers in his plants. And because of this reality, even before the pandemic, because we don't, we don't, didn't, we had a pandemic existing before the pandemic. We were losing a trillion dollars a year to the cost of child poverty. And $1.9 trillion of government revenue was lost by lowering the corporate tax rate in 2017. And $6.4 trillion has been lost because of endless wars. It's gonna take $16 trillion to fully deal with this pandemic. And the inaction on climate change has threatened us not only in life, but in money. You say, but this is a celebration. Why would you start here, Reverend Barbara? Because in this work, you only you can celebrate, but the celebration has to be to push us to more work and not just pat ourselves on the back. Because no matter how good we have been, no matter what we have done, we've not come to the day yet where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We've not come yet to the day well, we can claim that we are a perfect nation. We may be trying to be a more perfect, and that sometimes we're not trying, but we've not come to the place where we fully establish justice. And we've not ensured domestic tranquility and provided for the common defense and promoted the general welfare and ensured equal protection under the law for all people. So the celebration must be a consecration. We must not merely put our pat ourselves on the back. We must push ourselves forward. We must say, if we made it for 25 years, we can make it for 25 more. If we did this in 10 years, we can do more. In fact, we have to even be more intense. The fact that you've been around means your agitation and your intensity must grow because you don't, you know what's going on on the front line. And you know as how as many people as you has helped, there's still so much that has to be done and you can't do it all and we have to have fundamental policy change. Because what we see is not insurmountable. The truth is we don't have a scarcity of resources in this country or a scarcity of ideas. Policy choices is what creates people without health care and people in poverty and, and, and people without living wages. It's not personal moral choices, but policy choices. We got here because of the choices of human beings. And as James Baldwin said, if we made the world like this, I paraphrase, we can remake it. We got here because of a Southern strategy that began in the 1960s that pit black and white folk against one another to take over the South so that the South that has the least amount of population could control the nation in part. We got here because of Reaganomics and trickle down. We got here because of neoliberalism. We, we didn't, we, that's what produced the possibility of a Trump, but we don't have to stay here. We can push for a third reconstruction and Finally, what would a third reconstruction look like? What, what must, I believe, the, the, the California endowment must work on with all of us? What must we come together around? We have to say as one voice, in America, we must update the poverty measure 
and get a true accounting of who's poor and expand our social welfare programs to meet their needs. We must enact living wages. We must provide universal single-payer health care and guarantee that everybody has a right to housing and welfare and water and equitable, diverse public education. We must relieve debts that cannot be paid, student debts, housing debts, medical debt. We must expand and protect voting rights to save our democracy. We must ensure the rights of indigenous and native people and tribal nations. We must establish national commissions on truth, racial justice, and transformation, transformation and on reparation. We must enact comprehensive and just immigration reform that ensures access to legal documentation and ends detention and deport deportation and family celebration. We must embrace a climate agenda that prioritizes the poor and those hit first and worst by climate disaster. We must demilitarize our foreign policy borders and policing. We must have an infrastructure plan that's big enough that reaches down to poor communities first. We must redirect military spending and implement fair taxes and break free from decades of trickle-down economics. We must unmask the lies of distorted moral agenda and religious nationalism. We must have a third reconstruction. And in order to do that, we must continue. We must engage in indigenous-led movements from the bottom up. We must use moral language to frame and critique public policy and say some things are not about Democrat and Republican and left versus right, but it's about right versus wrong. We must, if necessary, demonstrate a commitment to civil disobedience that follows the steps of nonviolent action and designed to change the public conversation and consciousness. We must build a stage from which to lift the voices of poor folk and impact. We can't speak for them. We must trust their power, their, their power. We must build a stage so that the nation has to see the 140 million, see the 87 million that are without health care, and see in them themselves. We must recognize the centrality of racism, and we must, when somebody says, is it classism or is it racism, we must declare it is, it is. We must build a broad, diverse coalition of moral and religious leaders. Moral and religious leaders cannot be isolated in the pulpits and sit on the front line. This is the time that pulpits must be on fire and in the public square. We must build transformative, long-term coalition relationships rooted in agendas that don't measure success just by electoral outcomes, but measure success by our ability to change the temperature and change the atmosphere of the nation. We must make a serious commitment to academic and empirical analysis of policy. We don't just accept policy. We must analyze it and ask the question, how does this help the poor? How does this help those who are low wages and low wealth? We must, we must coordinate and use every form of social media, Twitter and Facebook, all of them to the advantage of the movement. We must engage in voter registration and education because poor and low wealth people now make up 30 percent of the electorate in this country, 65 million people. And in 15 states, if poor and low wealth people organize around an agenda, they could fundamentally change who sits in the White House, who sits in the Senate, who sits in the governor's office. We must pursue strong legal strategy. We cannot give up on the Constitution. We must dust it off. We must fight for it. We must demand what it says about equal protection under the law for all people. And we must call out the cultural artists, the singers, the poets, and all of them to, to, to sing the movement, to write poetry about the movement, to do word about the movement until the movement is in the very soul of the nation. And then we must resist one more moment mentality. We might have a good moment, but we can't stop there. We need movement, 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 movement. It's movement time, and we must decide that we will have a divine and an eternal disfavor with the things being the way they are. We will never be satisfied with the way things are. And one of my favorite passages of scripture is the stone that the builders rejected have now become the chief cornerstone. The rejected of this side, society can lead the revival. Those who have been rejected because of their sexuality, rejected because of their immigration status, rejected because of their poverty, rejected because of their health care or their sickness or their disability. That's where the power is. 
the stones that the builders have rejected can build a new cornerstone in America and one for justice. These are the people we must mobilize together with and moral leaders and advocates because God can use the rejected stones. God can use the bones in a valley to bring revival to a land. And we must hear something that Martin Luther King said 24 hours before he was killed. He was in Memphis with poor garbage workers. People told him not to go there. And he began to speak that last night and some people think the speech was, I've been to the mountaintop. That wasn't the essence of the speech. That was a closing. He had done it a number of times before. But in that, in that, in that moment, he said something that we can never forget. He said, brothers and sisters, America is a sick nation in some ways. A sick nation. And because of that, because of that, we've got to come together. We've got to organize together. We've got to stand together. We have to move together. We have to take on the triune evils of poverty and racism and militarism together. And today I say we have to take on systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, and the war economy, and the false moral net. We have to do it together. And then he said, he looked over history. He said, I'm glad I'm born right now when people are standing up. And then he said before 20, less than 24 hours before he was killed, he said, listen to me, listen to me. Nothing would be more tragic than for us to turn around now. Listen to me, the California endowment. Listen to me, every advocate that's on this call. Listen to me, even those of you that have fought and pushed many years. I know sometimes you want to sit down, but with the realities that we have, we can only celebrate for the moment. And celebration must lead to consecration because nothing would be more tragic than for us to turn around now until every child is educated and everybody is insured and has health care and every worker has a decent, decent wage and every immigrant is welcome and every person that's of a different sexuality is not made to feel like they don't belong until there is justice for all. Nothing, absolutely nothing except death. Absolutely nothing should make us think we can turn around now. Nothing would be more tragic than for us to turn back now. We must have a third reconstruction. And the California Endowment, as you have been, so must you be even the more in the fight that we face. Amen. Dr. Barber, brother on the road to justice, we are so grateful for you on this night for speaking so clearly about the work ahead, for challenging us to not turn back, to fight for the health and the well being of families in California and across this nation. And thank you for consecrating us with your powerful words and your enormous spirit. We are so very grateful. You've got our minds running and our hearts full, and we've received many, many questions on chat, but I wonder if you'd consider answering just a couple of those questions. Sure. The first one I would raise on behalf of someone who raised it for all of us is how, how do you fight uh, misinformation, disinformation, like the language of and the actions around voter fraud and that COVID isn't real and that we shouldn't be taking the vaccine. How do you fight that? Well, one of the things I think is we have to fight it and uh, we have to shift this narrative. And that's why we have to have a constant movement and not just one, one moment here, one moment there. And then the Poor People's Campaign, one of the ways we do it is we are constantly on the move, constantly in communities. And this coming June 21st, we are having a mass Poor People's Low Wage Workers Assembly Moral March on Washington digitally because of COVID. We had one last year digitally, 2.7 million people showed up. But this year, we're having it to not only challenge the narrative, but to launch 365 days 
of action towards a mass poor people's low wage, poor people, low wage workers assembly in person, moral march on Washington. You know, we hope it to be the largest gathering of poor and low wealth people and a stage built for poor and low wealth people because we have to take over the stage. We can't surrender the mic. We can't surrender the tweets. We can't surrender the text. We can't surrender the news. We can't surrender any of it. You know, we must fully embrace our First Amendment right and our God-given right to speak truth to power. And that's why it has to be constant. And so that's why even in when we celebrate, like tonight, even when we have celebration, we also have to, and even in the midst of celebration, have the courage to say what's yet undone. We can't even make ourselves think that because we've done some things that is, everything is okay. And I know that's not easy, but it's necessary. It's necessary. Um, we've got a lot of battling to do. As you heard me say in those 14 points of uh, moral organizing, one of them is also we have to not abandon even social media to the, to the quacks and the wax. <laughs> we <laughs> have to be there, fully be there. Um, I contend that preachers are going to have to do more like uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick did in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, when he, when if you went to his church on Sunday morning, you got the gospel, but the gospel was in tune with what was going on in the times. You know, we can't simply be preaching about a first century Jesus and a and a and a and a and a, 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 a Moses and the Red Sea and not connect it to the issues that are going that on today. So every mode of communication, we must be there. We must be there and we must speak the truth with our mouths and with our bodies and with the movement. Thank you. The second question and last question is, how do you do it? How do you find inspiration? How do you find fuel to keep you going in the midst of so much challenge, human suffering, injustice? Well, I give it first credit always to God and God's strength and God's power. Uh, you know, I myself battled with a crippling disease. I was told at 30 I wouldn't walk again. And God has been gracious enough um, that I have a limp and pain, but I'm able to move. And I, I, and I have always said, why? Because I believe you have to ask that question about your own life. Why are you still here? What's the purpose? But you know what really moves me is when I go places like in Appalachia and I meet people who are suffering immensely, and yet they're so full of hope and so ready to stand up to the system. Or I meet somebody like in Alabama, Pam, who died in COVID. And, but she was one of our leaders in the movement. And she said, we have to do this. We have to, and up to her last breath, she was fighting. Or I'm in the, in the Tenderloin in, um, in San Francisco, just walking down. And a homeless brother grabs me and said, we with you, Rev. Thank you. We're we going to stand up. And, you know, and I'm thinking, here's somebody who's homeless, and they have not lost their spirit to stand back. So who am I? And then lastly, you know, I've spent so much time doing COVID with, I'm, I'm somewhat of a mystic, a little bit like Howard Thurman. And I spent a lot of time with Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and and, and William Lord Garrison, the white uh, evangelical who stood up against slavery. And I just spend time with them and during the day and thinking and reading them. And I say, you know, they had more reason to quit than I do. I mean, you know, they could get up every morning. The slave got up every morning and said, up above my head, I hear music in there. There must be a God somewhere. And they didn't know what they, they knew that the day was going to bring more lashes and more destruction. And yet, they had something. And so who am I in this moment to think that I can rest when so many before me didn't rest? They stood in spite of horrendous odds. And as we came through this pandemic, Bishop, one of the things that dawned on me one day, I said, you know, if this virus was airborne, because I had one family that lost 12 family members, I said, there is no question that all of us were in the vicinity of this virus somewhere sometime. And so I said, it was just praying and thinking and meditating. And I said, why am I still here? Why am I still here? Because I'm not any better than the people that died. I'm not more faithful than them. God doesn't love me more than he loves them. And in the midst of that meditation, it dawned on me, that's the wrong question. Not why are you still here? Because you may never answer that. 
The question is, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. In other words, if you still have breath, because any of us are six minutes from death, uh, six minutes without breath, most of us are gone. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, that means every breath is precious and we don't have any breath to waste. And so maybe we need to come to the conclusion that it's a waste, waste of breath to be mean. It's a waste of breath to deal with injustice. It's a waste of breath to be hateful and racist and, and maniacal and destructive. And the only good use of breath is to be about love and truth and justice. And maybe then the question is not why am I still alive, but what am I going to do with this, these limited amount of breaths we have, whether it's six minutes, six days, six months, six hours, six years, or 60 years. And maybe it is to say, I'm gonna use every breath I have and every waking moment to try to breathe a little more love, a little more justice, a little more truth into this world. And maybe then, if we do that, a day will come that that which is divine will say to us, well done. Um, that's what keeps me going. The people have been around and a real serious reflection on the, on the, on the limit of life. But you know, this ain't no practice run, y'all. This is all we have. This is not a practice run. This is it. And if this is it, then I want to be a part and be with folk like you who get up every day thinking about not how can I tear the world apart, but how can we make it better? And how can somebody breathe a little bit easier because we lived and we did something to help make that happen? Your words are the heart of this celebration. BHC stands for all that you've described about that human relationship that inspires us to continue. And on this night, you <laughs> truly have been fuel for us, inspiration for us. You've consecrated us and we bless you on your way and look forward to the life journey that we'll be on together. God bless you. God bless you. Hi, I'm Senator Steve Bradford, and I represent the 35th Senate District of the Greater Los Angeles area, and I am the chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus. Congratulations to the California Endowment on celebrating your 25th anniversary and the last 10 years of building healthy communities in California. I wanna give a special shout out to my good friend, Dr. Bob Ross, for his outstanding leadership serving as president and CEO of the California Endowment for the last 21 years. The California Endowment objectives mirror that of the California Legislative Black Caucus's goals of equity for all disadvantaged Californians. Your work advancing healthy equity and justice in communities like mine promotes the best of our state's core values. We look forward to the next 10 years and beyond of building a healthier California for all. Congratulations on your 25th anniversary and the last 10 years of building healthy communities in California. A special shout out goes to the residents, organizers, advocates, and young people joining us tonight that have been part of the journey to transform communities across the state. The goal of advancing health and justice for all Californians continues for the next 10 years and beyond, but let's take a moment to celebrate the collective victories. On behalf of the California Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, congratulations to the California Endowment on 25 years of supporting communities. And a big shout out to all of you, the residents, advocates, and youth who made your voices heard over the last 10 years as part of building healthy communities. Today, we celebrate all the organizers, residents, advocates, and young people up and down the state who have shown up for one another to fight for a California for all. Hello, this is State Senator Maria Elena Durazo, and I want to extend a big congratulations to the California Endowment, and especially to my good friend, I think, Dr. Bob Ross, on your 25th anniversary. Our conversations throughout the years have been so important to me personally. The goal of advancing health and justice for all Californians goes on, yet tonight we celebrate our collective victories. On behalf of the California Latino Legislative Caucus, a big shout out to all of you, the working class residents, advocates, and the youth who made your voices heard over the last 10 years as part of the Building Healthy Community initiatives. As a caucus, we prioritize legislation to build back our communities stronger than they were before the pandemic, including dignified wages, 
the right to a safe workplace. And top of our list is expansion of Medi-Cal to seniors, regardless of immigration status. Thank you for all the work that you do. I am proud to be your partner in Sacramento. I had the pleasure of meeting Beatrice for the first time in 2007 when she joined the California Endowment as the Los Angeles Regional Program Officer. As a program associate at the time, I learned by watching Beatrice in action. She could move seamlessly from a meeting with an elected official to a conversation with grantee partners to a community gathering with residents, always thinking about what she was learning and how we as a foundation could do better, how we could do more. She was a woman who led with heart, compassion and strength, always making sure that the community's voice and power were at the center of the work. I marveled at her ability to plant the seeds of an idea and watch it grow over time. From the endowment support of community health workers to integrated voter engagement efforts to the commitment to the arts and cultural activities as part of building healthy communities, Beatrice was always supporting community leaders and power building. I will always be grateful to her for her mentorship leadership, and vision. Like Jennifer, for me, B was an inspirational leader and a supportive colleague and friend. When B was with you, she was fully present. She dedicated herself to listening, fairness, pragmatic possibility, and movement. I marveled at her energy and her sense of purpose. She would talk about how she was constantly looking around the corner to figure out what we needed to be paying attention to. Um, and to respond. As Jennifer beautifully described, a bee was led by the power of people and trusted them with their ideas and their plans. And she often served as a confidant and a strategist for bodies of work that have grown over time. Bee had a belief in people and their ability to step into their own power. As someone fortunate to bask in her energy, passion, and intelligence, I am forever grateful for Beatrice Solis and who she was for us. I remember the day I met B. The year was 2011 and I was attending my first Building Healthy Communities Communications Coordinator convening. Her voice immediately connected to my heart and I knew from that moment that my life would never be the same. She had the ability to reach in and pull out strengths and qualities that I did not know existed. She told me to be a voice and a presence and gave me the courage to stand in my truth. Over the years, she connected me to her network, training opportunities, and opened doors that would have otherwise stayed closed. Seeing her smile and hearing her laugh provided me with the motivation I needed. And if I was ever stuck, I knew she was there to nudge me in the right direction. She was a healer and my mentor, and I joyfully share her with the many others that she's healed and mentored. She continues to inspire me to become the best version of myself, and I have never been more proud or lucky to have known someone as beautiful as B. Today, it is my honor to stand here with Jennifer and Tara to introduce the video in her own words. Uno, dos, tres. 
Beatrice Solis, B-E-A-T-R-I-Z, S-O-L-I-S. La, 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 la. <laughs> My name is Beatrice Solis, and I am with the California Endowment. I'm a program director. Al inicio, quiero decir muchísimas gracias para andar en este camino con nosotros, porque realmente creemos que este plan es ustedes. Van a dar vida a este plan para que sigue en los 10 años. The eight years that I've been here, we've sort of become far more active and involved, not just through our grant making and giving, but being a foundation that actually listens, reacts, and participates. You can have the best policies on the book, but if you're not increasing power and voice in community, you're not really getting far enough. Sisterhood Rising Camp is one of those elements that women and girls matter in the work. We have young women that are already sharing sort of the challenges that they have in their community, but they're very, very clear about their resiliency and their power. What I really want to bring back to my community is like restorative justice. I really want to be in Congress. Once you have a sense of power, you can never take it away. So when people feel empowered that they are no longer afraid or see that by lifting their voice or attending a meeting in the community that they belong in those settings as well. I would like us all to just take a moment of silence. And this moment of silence is around the power and love in this room. If you just close your eyes for one second and imagine the love that is surrounding you and you imagine that power and that connection that you have with the people here, that feeling that gets to your heart, that gets to your mind, and that you are powerful, and you have so many people around here that love and care about you. It's so true, standing up here and looking at the beauty is such a fabulous feeling. How much we have to love each other and how much we have to trust each other and work across difference. Whatever, how big or small we see that difference is, we have to stretch that muscle to really include others. Give it up for this amazing lady. Gracias. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to pay tribute to our friend, our colleague, our teacher, B. Solis. As I said in a video tribute to her not too long ago, B. translated love into justice. What I meant by that was she lived at the intersection of the head and the heart. B. felt that you can't separate ration from emotion, that you can't pull apart data and art. She insisted that building healthy communities have a cultural signature. She brought that culture, poetry, music, to BHC. She centered family, community, relationship, and spirit in our work every single day day. She taught us to take powerful feelings of love, of community, and to translate those into the reality, the reality of justice. We love you, B. Now to Dr. Ross. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Beatrice Solis was represented the moral and spiritual compass of the California Endowment. Uh, she called me boss, but she and I really knew who the boss was at the California Endowment. Uh, she led by example. She constantly, consistently elevated uh, the experiences, uh, the voice, the wisdom, um, essence of those that are most marginalized and ignored and oppressed um, and centered of their experiences in our work. 
And so to uh, to Beatriz, uh, so Lisa, our friend, our sister, uh, to her wonderful family, uh, thank you for sharing um, her with us, the California Endowment and the Building Healthy Communities. In honor of Beatrice's legacy, I am thrilled to announce this evening the establishment of the new Dr. Beatriz Maria Solis Memorial Endowment Fund at the Women's Foundation of California. This fund will support the Women's Foundation well-established, respected, and successful Women's Policy Institute. We're honored that in recognition of a $3 million grant from our board of directors at the California Endowment, the Institute will be renamed the Dr. Beatriz Maria Solis Policy Institute to celebrate and preserve these legacy in perpetuity. She dedicated her life to advancing justice by developing systems change solutions, building leadership and elevating the voices and, exp and expertise of communities of color. She was especially committed to building the leadership of women, particularly young women of color across the state of California. Beyond her tireless work to build a better California for all, be centered her work with community leaders, policymakers, academics, philanthropists, and other stakeholders in her values of community inclusion and love. We are deeply grateful to the Women's Foundation for recognizing B's contribution to the movement for equity and justice. A special thanks and shout out to Serena Khan, their terrific CEO, and her team for the generous and collaborative efforts to establish this fitting memorial. We are most humbled and gratified by the contributions already made to the fund by the philanthropic institutions and community leaders and individual donors who recognize the opportunities to support leadership. An additional $80,000 has already been raised and I know we're surpassing that figure on a daily basis. We're grateful to all of the U.S. donors. The Policy Institute is also accepting applications for its next statewide cohort of leaders. If you have interest in this, please go to the Women's Foundation website for additional information. I believe in the chat, the donor page uh, may be placed uh, into it if you're interested in supporting further. Uh, thank you for joining us in this glorious and fitting tribute to to our, our friend, our colleague, our sister, Beatriz Maria Solis. Sandra? Thank you, Dr. Ross. B was like a sister to so many of us at TCE and within the, B the BHC community. We love her dearly, we miss her daily, and continue to be inspired by her brilliance, her strength, and love of humanity. Anyone that spent any time with B knows how much her family meant to her. So it is my honor to introduce you to Bee's amazing family, her husband, Mohammed Pasabani, and her two sons, Aydin and Avi. Today we are greatly pleased, extremely gratified, and immensely thankful to the California Endowment and the Women's Foundation of California for giving such a respect to my beloved wife and mother to Aydin and Avi with establishing the Dr. Beatrice Maria Solis Endowment Fund at the Women's Foundation of California and renaming the Women's Policy Institute in B's honor. This permanent fund will support a cause that B championed. It is also an opportunity for advocates to continue the bold and passionate spirit of B by learning how to infuse policy skills and the grassroots community building know-how to advocate and to advance racial, economic, and gender justice across the state. As we are here to share with the community of changemakers our appreciation for this special moment that honors B's legacy, we are excited and looking forward to seeing how the future advocates and activists of the Beatrice Solis Policy Institute will build their own legacy as future leaders for social change, become models of transitioning love to justice, and having their lives of passion brighten the altar of harshness. Be strong, now and always in service of love of community. That's what she would have wanted. Thank you. Ayakui. Hello, my name is Geneva Wiki. I'm a senior program manager at the California Endowment, and I love that I get to speak after that wonderful tribute to our dear B. Like many of us, uh, she was a coach and a mentor to me. The last text I got from her was a clear directive to use my knowledge and love of community to lead with heart and strength. 
Five years ago, TC hired me directly from my community of the Yurok Reservation in Del Norte County. Since 2009, I had served as the hub manager while the executive director of the Wild Rivers Community Foundation. I've been asked to take a moment to publicly acknowledge our powerful Building Healthy Communities hub managers. I loved my role as hub manager. You'll remember when VHC launched in 2009, TC had made a public commitment to fund the community for 10 years and in Del Norte at $10 million. This was unprecedented partnership with a private foundation for our rural and tribal community. And at that time I had a new baby and a toddler and as hub manager, I got to create spaces for my community to come together to dream, to imagine what a healthy community would look like and to ask the hard questions about what would it really take to change the broken systems and policies to achieve, achieve long-term equity. So like many of you, my kids grew up in the playrooms of community meetings where we spent many evenings and weekends with post-it notes and hard conversations. In that process, we got to dream new dreams, but we also had to confront old wounds of Native American massacres, racist beliefs about our Hmong immigrant neighbors, and a long history of disinvestment. There have been many terms to describe the role of hub manager and their teams. The glue, catalytic power broker, the heartbeat, my least favorite, the connective tissue, but what I've seen as the role of hub managers and hub teams, you recruit and develop the leadership and you support the healing and transformation of the most directly impacted residents and young people. You center their lived experiences and you support them in collective action to enable systems change and to hold decision makers accountable, sometimes even TCE. You employ a racial justice and equity framework, and in doing so, you've held space for so many to grieve and heal and grow on their journey to create health and racial equity in your community. Hub managers and teams have been TC's partner, co-strategist, circle keeper, co-troublemaker, and mirror for the last 10 years. You've been our road dog through 10 outcomes and four big results, logic models, collective impact tables, three health happens here campaigns, 12 transformative policies, five drivers of change, countless wins, inventories, and North Star goals and indicators. You responded with grace to TCE requests like, can you find and prepare five undocumented youth under the age of 18 to fly on an airplane to a convening next week? Or can you share the last decade of transformative work in a one hour interview with our consultants? You've managed boxes of swag, including TCE socks, taken flack for our billboards, and translated TCE speak into community language more than we'll ever know. But in all seriousness, we recognize that hub managers and teams have had to balance complex and often painful community dynamics with both the treetops and the grassroots. We recognize that change happens at the speed of trust and all of you hold powerful capacity to not only build trust, but to peddle hope and to speak truth to power. As my dear colleague, Michelle Carrillo, the Del Norte and Tribal Lands Hub Manager says, on the best days, this role is like holding hands with, with, on one side with TC and the other with community and we're running forward together powerfully. And on the worst days, it feels like I'm being ripped in half. Hub managers and staff, let me thank you. As we move forward now into three bold ideas in the power of flower on behalf of TCE, I thank you for all the seen and unseen work you have done to create the conditions for us to even be talking about centering racial equity and supporting power building ecosystems as the path to health equity in California. Like many of you, my children are now teenagers and they got to grow up in a place watching young people lead voter candidate forums eating local organic food for school lunch, witnessing Hmong and Latina aunties organize alongside their native grandmas in public actions for change. So we thank you for tending the soil, nurturing the relationships, planting the seeds of emerging grassroots groups, developing new leaders and holding hard lines for racial equity and justice. Diana, Kim, Roxanne, Michelle, Howell, James, Nahanda, Sonia, Sylvia, Sol, Ruben, Andrea. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We know your commitment to creating healthy and equitable communities will continue and we're forever grateful for your leadership and your partnership. 
So now let's see four of our hub managers in action with this short video. As most people know, in 2009, 2010, the U.S. economy hit rock bottom. A lot of government funding and philanthropic funding was pulling back. At the same time, the California Endowment was announcing that they were going to invest millions of dollars into communities. I could see instantly that this was going to be an opportunity for us to do something from the beginning and actually probably see it all the way through. We were having conversations around, you know, how do we do this work together? What is it that we want to accomplish? We knew resident power, youth power building was going to be very important to this initiative. We had county and city officials also saying that they wanted to be involved. What we realized very early on was that, in fact, some of these system leaders were actually protecting the status quo. Our former mayor actually called TCE and was like, what are you doing in our city? We don't want you here, we don't want your money. It was definitely about power. It was about wanting to control something that was gonna challenge and change the political landscape. There's a couple of ways to influence and wield power, and that's with money, right, or with work. And so organizing is work. My name is Christine Pettit. I'm executive director of Long Beach Forward. I'm hub manager for Building Healthy Communities Long Beach. Long Beach is a city that people talk about as very diverse. It's also a city that is incredibly divided. There's a lot of acknowledgement of the city's diversity without acknowledging the city's inequities. We found that it's a seven year life expectancy difference depending on where you live in Long Beach. We can talk about the issues, but it's also really a matter of life and death. Long Beach is really in its infancy when it comes to community organizing and there is a culture that we really have work to change. We have no protections in place for renters. We don't have a good plan for affordable housing. When it comes to making land use decisions, we had older white homeowners come out and say, we don't want to change, everything is fine how it is. So there was that resistance politically to the organizing. We've been chipping away at the housing issue for years. But we are starting to see changes. We see decision makers talking about issues like inclusionary housing, even rent control. We're at a tipping point. I think there are people who are trying to really hold on to the status quo while we're pushing and pushing. I'm Sandra Celedon and I serve as the President and Chief Executive Officer for Fresno Building Healthy Communities. When we talk about why politicians are, are hesitant to invest in our communities, why there's a history of segregation, it all leads back to race and it's still very much present. Fresno has grown uh, into a divided city and it really shows in the, in the division between North and South Fresno that shapes out in the environment and the investments that we make, where parks are located, where resources like retail are located. I remember vividly this group of 13 and 14 year olds who said to us, why aren't you guys talking about parks? And I said, well, what about parks? And they said, well, the fact that we don't have any parks, that we have to take three buses to get to the closest park. The city of Fresno hadn't looked at the parks master plan in like 30 years. And they literally just put it on a shelf somewhere and then never looked back. As advocates, what we really wanted to craft was the language to include in the general plan to make sure that the Parks Master Plan got updated. But it also served as this tool to organize folks, to train young people on land use issues. The power of young people, of residents filling that chamber at City Hall, prevented any of our conservative city council people from voting against the Parks Master Plan, whether they liked it or not. So we got a unanimous vote for the Parks Master Plan. But that didn't solve the issue. There's this huge deficit. There's not enough money for parks. And it inspired this greater conversation that we're still holding today. What I tell these young people is, that was your power. That's something that these young people will never forget, and they will never unlearn. I've been with Mid-City Can nine years. I started about two days before the initiative unfolded. Mid-City Kent's been in City Heights for 30 years this year. 
I think that's actually been one of our strengths. There was already partnerships and structure and methodology in place that then we were able to build upon. San Diego is historically really conservative. Talking about policing issues, racial profiling, all of these issues that are really emotional and intense for people, those were all no-goes. When I first started working on youth bus passes, people would tell me, this will never happen. This is baloney. You're misleading people, Diana. But today, you have people making it a major ballot priority for 2020. One of the power building mechanisms has been to really activate and build a culture of voting in communities like City Heights. City Heights shares districts with some of San Diego's wealthiest neighborhoods who have some of the highest propensity voting. It's our goal to build a voting block by the year 2020. It's going to kind of make City Heights the swing community, which means almost anybody who's going to want to get anything done in the district that City Heights shares with these other communities is going to have to give City Heights what it wants. My name is Kimberly Williams, and I am the Hub Director for Sacramento Building Healthy Communities. We're the capital city, and so while the state capital sits here, I think folks often forget that we're actually a community as well. We spend a lot of time really just talking to our residents. Uh, we surveyed some 8,000 folks in our community. And for Sacramento, the priority was around food access, it was around health access, youth development, and economic development. The Urban Ag Ordinance was definitely one of the successes for our Building Healthy Communities initiative. We have a food issue in our community. It's a food desert. There's folks who don't have access to healthy food for miles. What we wanted to do with the Urban Ag was allow for people to be able to grow food in their own homes or in their own backyards and then be able to sell that. They couldn't do that at the time. We had to first get the ordinance passed at the city. And it was getting, rallying the folks, troops, whether it was residents, farmers, um, folks who were in the food access business, so to speak, and showing up to city council and testifying. I actually remember sitting in the council chambers, listening to them testify, and the one of the women was saying, I've never done this before. I've never, you know, it's like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be okay, just speak from your heart. I've actually seen her now in other meetings on other issues, speaking out. It gave her, I think, the um, energy and the desire to continue using her voice. Now folks can actually sell the food that they're growing to their neighbors. We've got a local farm literally across the street from where our office is. He's now able to provide more food in the community. We've had some significant wins. Measure N, a living wage for hotel workers in Long Beach. Young people who couldn't even vote yet, but maybe they had a parent in the hospitality industry. They were knocking on doors, flexing their civic engagement muscles, and talking to people about why this was important. Some of our favorite campaigns are the skate park, our work around juvenile justice reform, school bus passes, watching that become a movement, uh, the halal lunches in schools, which is the Muslim diet. Parents had been going to the school district for years saying, hey, my kids, they're not able to eat lunch. The school district just wasn't hearing them. We were able to pass a policy across the whole school district that wherever there's a significant number of students and families that have dietary requirements, the school district's gonna try to meet their needs. The work that I'm the most proud of was the non-resident fund. The county of Fresno was looking to cut services for undocumented residents. And we were able to create a non-resident fund that enables undocumented people in our community to access specialty care, life-saving specialty care. We put together a people's budget campaign that had the Invest in Youth campaign. It had a campaign related to housing. It had a campaign related to language access. The city council spent hours talking about our issues. In the end, they voted on a budget that incorporated three out of four of our issues. We have really forced our city to talk openly about equity and about issues related to the whole of our community. We had um, a protest happen at one of the high schools, and it was just amazing to me to turn the news on and see three of the young people that would be with us at our leadership academy leading this protest at their high school. It lasted a week, and they were able to get what they wanted. Kids who started in our first year of youth council in 2010 
are now coming back from college and we're hiring them. Young people have, have grown up seeing the struggle of their parents and at the same time understanding that there is a different path. It is a powerful thing to watch young people who are saying no more, you know, we need change and are ready to be a part of that change. That's the hope, right? And I think that that's the biggest thing that Fresno Building Healthy Communities has been able to, to really awaken and create, and that's hope. Philanthropy struggles with how to measure that. What we're trying to do is no short of transform our society. My advice to philanthropists uh, and foundations and donors, you've got to engage with community members. If we're going to have real change in our communities, it's going to take an effort from everybody. Change is not something that happens um, in a neat logic model. Change also takes patience. Listen to the people on the ground and then provide the resources necessary to achieve those outcomes. It's very hard to get capacity building grants. It's those small organizations that are, that are doing the, what I say, the grimy work, a lot of it with nothing. So use your power and use your voice to do something. Our residents are really struggling. We're winning things, but um, conditions are still hard for people. I want to see communities across our city that have all of the resources necessary for individuals to be able to live healthy and um, to live with dignity. We've got to make sure that our kids are graduating, that our kids are not getting suspended. We really have to cut off the school to prison pipeline. I want to see 5,000 voters at the polls. I want to see a Long Beach where there isn't a life expectancy difference, where we improve health for everybody. I really feel that part of my work is about creating a future that's worthy of the next generation. I see, I see the change that has happened and I see what can happen. People have to believe that the impossible is possible. Hello everyone, this is Ricardo Lara, your California Insurance Commissioner. I want to warmly congratulate the California Endowment on celebrating its 25th anniversary and the marking of the 10th year of the Building Healthy Communities Initiative. It's hard to imagine California without the endowment. There's no other single organization that has contributed as much to the holistic well being of this state and so many of our diverse communities and the health of every single Californian, which I'm particularly proud of. You should be proud of the important and life changing work you are doing and continue to lead across our state. As someone fighting on the side of our hardworking people every day, I know I can always count on the endowment to be on the right side of justice and history. Thank you for all the amazing work you do and cheers to another bright 25 years ahead and to many more victories. Felicidades. Hi, I'm Dr. Shirley Weber, the California Secretary of State. And I'm here to congratulate you for 25 amazing years of service to the state of California. You know, this has been a journey that has transformed California in every sense of the word. And I am so pleased to say to you, congratulations on making us a better and healthier state. And I can hardly wait for the next 25 years. Congratulations. Good evening, I'm Rob Bonta, California Attorney General. Thank you to Robert Ross for the opportunity to say, Congratulations to the California Endowment on your 25th anniversary, and congratulations on the last 10 years of building healthy communities here in California. That work that you do in social justice and improving the health of communities all across California would not be accomplished without the help of the residents, organizers, advocates, and young people who get involved. So to all of you who are joining us tonight, a special congratulations goes out to you as well. I also want to thank the California Endowment for your $100 million commitment to help uplift API communities across the state. Right now, our community is in a full state of crisis when it comes to API hate. But together, we can and must stand united against hate. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, or who you love. An injustice against one is an injustice against all. So thank you for your continued fight for justice. Tonight, the goal of advancing health and justice for all Californians continues for the next 10 years and beyond. But let's take a moment to celebrate the collective victories. So here's to the next 25 years. Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Sean Genright. I'm the former chair of the California Endowment. You know, someone said in the 
earlier video, turning pain into power. And that is precisely what matters in our work for community change. And we know that people power is the real secret sauce of how to support communities. It's the real um, magic that works in transforming our communities and fighting for justice and policy change. You know, tonight we've seen and we've heard from policymakers and community residents and youth leaders and, uh, and everybody that's part of our TCE community that talked about the dedication and commitment to what it takes to really build healthy communities in California. And I'm reminded of Reverend Barber's words that we are consecrating our work tonight. Um, it doesn't seem that long ago uh, when I first visited Long Beach and San Diego and learned about community organizations and how those organizations were la launching campaigns in the neighborhood for change. It doesn't seem that long ago when I uh, went up into the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, for our sons and brothers camp and really bonded and saw the magic of community when young men and, and young people of color came together to heal, to support one another, and to have an imagination and a vision for how they would transform their communities. That camp, those Sons and Brothers camps, I remember form bonds that matter that are paying dividends for justice as we speak. And we are so honored to be in partnership with all 14 communities, and we are so excited about what's to come in the decade ahead. Now, I can't remember everything that happened over the past 10 years. It's been a long, seems like a long time ago. So. Here's a quick look back to give us a reminder of our time together. There was this feeling of being undervalued, unappreciated, not really feeling like even if you did engage, would there actually be a difference? Always seeing things that was going on in my community, seeing the disparity that was going on, and the over policemen. City and school officials were sort of collaborating, but it was a collaboration of suppression, not a collaboration of support. We need to be able to say, I'm gonna turn my pain into power and use it to change the things that have at one point hurt me and my family and my community. Because we know the truth is that we can only get things done when we work as one. Building healthy communities and the California Endowment is synonymous but each site is very different. Each initiative has shaped to what is needed in the community. People Power is really pushing against that status quo to bring about the change that we need for all folks to live equitably and to thrive. As folks are being displaced from the Bay Area, it started only amplifying the lack of affordable housing. We were the kind of organization, we just kept to ourselves. But now building healthy communities has allowed us to recognize that we have a unique role to play. We have been able to build a whole network of relationships and funding to go towards future affordable housing. I knew there was park disparity already. Like, I just thought it was normal. We have a park called Pulibus Park out here in Southeast Fresno. There's not even grass, it's like dirt, and you're like breathing in that dirt. BAC was able to engage me and like advocate and say like, yo, this isn't right. After that experience, it was really big for me to be able to feel comfortable enough to use my voice. We were doing our work well before the BHC, and we actually enhanced the BHC with our work. Because we have a place-based strategy, it really is synchronized with the BHC, and we ended up building a statewide coalition called the Dignity Schools Campaign California out of the thread that we all were working on ending the school to prison pipeline. All of us were using community organizing, very people-led, people-centered power building as opposed to just policy change. 
We had to confront the LA School Police Department, which at that time was the largest police department in the country to sort of tackle this culture that had predetermined which students were going to do well and which students were not. Police don't belong in our schools. We began to see in a lot of the BHC gatherings that will require real people power not only to tackle access to testing or do we defund this police or this police. We have to understand that as a bigger system, that's the type of people power we're building. Without BHC, United Women of East Africa support team wouldn't have come to fruition. Parents realized that their children were coming home from school very hungry. They were concerned about whether or not they had access to culturally appropriate healthy food. Whether you are a Vietnamese mom, a Latina mom, or an East African woman, right? Everyone saw kind of naturally how important that was. Halal Meals to Schools program, I mean, that is, that is huge. All young people should have access to culturally literate food, and they shouldn't be trying to learn while hungry. I got engaged with TCE. When I was in jail, I was in the California Youth Authority. They believed in us when no one else believed in us. You're like, wow, I actually can have a career now. To me, a community is essentially reestablishing the notion of the village. We need to restructure it then. You know what I mean? We need to do some restorative justice. Prop 47 was probably the most progressive piece of legislation dealing with criminal justice reform in the state of California. We're doing a lot of great work to clean up our neighborhoods, we fight for community-based interventions and solutions to reduce violence and crime. The only way in which you're going to adequately address the problem of violence, and particularly gang violence, is dismantling systemic and institutional racism. TCE has been a tremendous partner and support. We've learned the importance of building and maintaining good relationships even when we are probably on opposite ends of the spectrum of an opinion or a philosophy. And that's just one example. There's a number of barriers and obstacles and challenges that people face trying to get access to healthcare. Having an engaged community who can be clear about what do we need to be healthy and how do we have say over how that happens, that's what's really going to make it possible. There was inherent conflict because people were coming together from their different professional lives, personal lives, whatever. Those conflicts did happen. And what I appreciate about BHC is it like didn't mind, didn't shy away from those conflicts. What BHC did was say very firmly, we care about resident leadership and we're not gonna give that up. We always say that the people closest to the pain have the solutions to the problems and they know what they need, right? People power is community coming together and holding our elected officials and systems accountable. We have to remind ourselves like we're the ones that have the power, we're the ones that are being impacted the most and we're the ones working a lot. We have I have a lot of faith in our community and the residents in our community that are already acknowledging the power that they have and that they will continue building those mutual, accountable relationships that actually move the needle. I think that's what building healthy communities in California Endowment has been able to do. And I wouldn't even say, like, them be able to do it. It's been the folks on the ground, like the grassroots leaders. It's not a foundation driving the work. It's not a politician driving the work. It's the people. Bob Ross here again, a beautiful, beautiful video uh, brings uh, goosebumps uh, for me in terms of what's been accomplished over the years. Uh, apologies for how, uh, how dark my, my video is, but uh, maybe the metaphor is the 
beautiful sunset uh, setting outside my window here in downtown LA in the office and a, and a beautiful sun setting of, of BHC. Um, just really, really powerful memories and, and achievements. Um, once again, thank you for those of you on the front lines who are doing the work, community residents and young leaders, the hub managers, just phenomenal. The video was fantastic. Uh, great support from our board of directors. You'll hear in a second from, from uh, Dr. Professor Sh Sean Jinride and Bishop uh, Cancanio. But I do want to close with a shout out to our staff at the California Endowment. Uh, whether they were program managers who were interacting directly with community leaders and they would channel, uh, our program staff would channel what they were hearing from impacted persons in the community and from uh, grassroots leaders and, and, and nonprofit leaders in the community. You would hear about um, your experiences and what you wanted us to do better, smarter, faster, or, or improve upon. And so just a big shout out to every single member of the California Endowment staff uh, who are with us on this journey, uh, with you on this journey uh, in terms of building healthy communities, uh, actors and, and players. And, and thank you so much for all that you've done on behalf of this great state and in partnership with us at the California Endowment. Sean. You know, I think, uh, thanks, Bob. One of the, the most important lessons that we've learned um, even in our mistakes, um, is that to invest in you. It's people power. Uh, investing in your leadership, investing in the dreams, investing in youth leadership. We've, known, we've learned over the past 10 years that no change is possible without the power of people with a committed vision and a strategy to execute. And so we, we are so honored to have um, been able to ride with you and you ride with us. And these lessons will carry forth in our next journey together. And we know that people power is at the foundation of the California Endowment. And that we know that investing in the power of people will ultimately create that beloved community that we dream about for our state of California. Bishop. I joined Dr. Ross and Dr. Shinwright with the voice and the support of the entire TCE Board of Directors to say thank you. Thank you to those at the ground level at the BHCs, community partners, community leaders, and certainly the staff of TCE. What an amazing job. What a night to celebrate. Hermanos, hermanas, compañeros y compañeros, gracias. Gracias por el excelente trabajo que han hecho, por el esfuerzo con coraje y valor de cada uno de ustedes. Nuestras comunidades en esta noche tienen esperanza. Indeed, because of the work of this tremendous partnership, there is hope on this night, hope in the hearts of young people and children and families all across the state and beyond, the hope of health and well-being. What an incredible foundation for the work yet to come. So on this night, let us continue to celebrate. May this night fill us with, with joy. Give us rest as well so that we can begin the work anew tomorrow. Good night and God bless. Cheers. <laughs>